is biological age optimal on a carnivore diet? So to address that question, uh, I'm going to examine Paul Saladino, who's a medical doctor. So we're going to analyze uh, his blood test results. So he posted his blood test data uh, while being on the carnivore diet on his, in his show note showed show notes for when he went on uh, Joe Rogan's podcast. So I've uh, I reviewed his data, and these are his data uh, for uh, albumin, creatinine, glucose, C-reactive protein, percentage of lymphocytes, mean red cell volume, red cell distribution width, alkaline phosphatase, white blood cells, age, and those variables. Uh, enter into a biological age calculator known as uh, phenotypic age, uh, give him a score of 39.59 years. Now, that's 3.4 years younger than his chronological age. Uh, so from my experience, that's good that it isn't older than his actual age. But uh, as I'm going to show in a minute, uh, he can do better. And uh, so I'm not here to bash any uh, dietary ideology. My view is that we should be eating, exercising, and supplementing with the goal of optimizing our internal health, including our biomarkers. So uh, this is just one blood test and of his. So uh, how is his data a few months later? Like, what's the average? You know, uh, you'll never see in a scientific study only one data point published for one subject. So, you know, uh, we would need more data to figure out what's his you know, natural variation year to year. Is this an accurate, an accurate uh, reflection of what his biological age is uh, for every, every test? Or is this, you know, the worst of his uh, blood test data? Also, it's, again, it's an N of one. So the, uh, with the goal of quantifying biological age on a carnivore diet, there are currently no published studies. So I wanted to compare Paul's data against a bigger cohort, you know, to see how, how it compares. But there are no studies for the carnivore diet and looking at biological age uh, as of yet. So with that in mind, if anyone is carnivore, vegan, vegetarian, whatever your dietary approach is, send me your data if you've got data for each of these blood tests and we can evaluate which, is, which seems to be the best approach for optimizing biological age. I'm going to argue my approach is best because I let the biomarkers dictate what my diet and even what my uh, exercise training approach should be. So what's my data? So I've measured four times in uh, 2020, and for those who have seen those previous uh, videos, uh, this will be a review, uh, and my apologies. For those of you who are new, welcome. So uh, my first blood test measurement that included the nine biological age uh, uh, variables uh, was in February of 2020, uh, thereby resulting in a, a, a phenotypic age, otherwise known as biological age, of 34.5 years. Uh, notice that my chronological age is 47. I turned 47 in January. So uh, based on this data, I'm 12 and a half years younger than my chronological age. So then I retested in March. Uh, again, uh, my biological age was 33.3, uh, uh, so still doing pretty great. And then worse readings, uh, probably uh, because of my seasonal allergies or one reason, seasonal allergies that I get in the summer. Uh, so now I've got a, a phenotypic age, or otherwise known as biological age, uh, 35.7. And then uh, again, my, my measurement in July of 39, my worst uh, measurement ever. Uh, but nonetheless, when I take the average of these four values in 2020, I'm at an, a little bit more than 11 years younger than my chronological age. So if you remember Paul's data, it was 3.4 years younger than his chronological age. So I'd argue that uh, Paul could do better. And uh, including other stuff into his diet may be a wise approach, or at least doing the experiment to see how it affects his biological age. So uh, I didn't really introduce the biological age uh, calculator that I'm using. So let's take a step back with the goal of optimizing biological age. Let's take a step back and go through what it is and how can we optimize it or what, what's inherent in the test so that we can potentially uh, optimize it. So the, uh, as I mentioned on the first slide, the uh, biological age calculator known as uh, uh, Levine's phenotypic age uh, comprises uh, albumin, creatinine, glucose, C-reactive protein, percentage of lymphocytes, uh, the average red blood cell volume, the average uh, or, or the red, red blood cell distribution width, uh, alkaline phosphatase, uh, white blood cell count, and age. So the combination of these nine uh, uh, biomarkers uh, and age was shown to predict chronological age uh, almost uh, perfectly linearly. So uh, the correlation for, for uh, the biological age calculator was 0 0.94. Note that a, a correlation of 1.0 is perfectly linear. So a score, a, a correlation of 0 0.94 is a very strong correlation. Now this data was uh, derived from NHANES 3, so the third National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Uh, so then uh, they replicated this study uh, in another cohort, so NHANES 4. 
and they found an even stronger correlation or very similar strong correlation of 0.96, as you can see in this picture, uh, uh, phenotypic age, otherwise known as biological age, almost perfectly linear, linearly correlates with chronological age. So in other words, these nine uh, biomarkers that are commonly found on a blood test when you go to your, doc your doctor every year and age are very strongly correlated with chronological age. So what's the significance of this biological age calculator with disease risk? So having an older biological age is associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So we can see that here I've uh, put an arrow uh, and so for every one year increase in biological age, all-cause mortality risk increases by 9%. Now, th those findings uh, were similar regardless of age. So if you were a young adult, middle-aged adult, or an older adult, uh, you're, if you had an older biological age, your all-cause mortality risk increased, uh, for example, here by 13%, 10%, and 8% in young, middle-aged, and older adults, respectively. So what about disease-specific mortality? Uh, so I've uh, indicated where the uh, having an older biological age was associated with a higher uh, uh, mortality risk for each of these diseases. So heart disease, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, um, diabetes, influenza or, or pneumonia, and uh, kidney-related issues, nephritis or nephrosis. So for each of those outcomes, having an older biological age was associated with an increased outcome-specific mortality. Now, note that um, having an older biological age was associated with uh, uh, significantly associated with uh, an increased um, uh, risk for mortality from chronic lower respiratory disease and influenza or pneumonia. So for me, the obvious thought is, well, what about uh, uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 related mortality? So in a preprint uh, that was uh, recently published, um, uh, we, can, we can see that an older biological age, as assessed by this biological age calculator, Levine's phenotypic age, was associated with an increased risk for all-cause mortality, ACM, in uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, so that's recent, but that's a preprint. So, you know, they've got to go through the peer review process um, before it's uh, officially published. All right. So within, so now that I've shown you the biological age calculator, calculator phenotypic age, within the reference range, what's optimal for each of these nine biological age biomarkers? And once we know what's optimal, we can then work on optimizing the ones that should be uh, improved and, you know, stay the course for the ones that uh, are, are in good shape. So I'm going to analyze Paul's data to see where, where his uh, biological age data is good and where it can be improved. So first, going right through this list one by one, albumin, higher is better. And how do we know that? So I'm going to show you representative data for very large studies. Uh, the larger the study, the strong, potentially the stronger the data. Uh, if you've got a very small study, you know, it, the, the results may not be uh, generalizable to the larger population, population. Whereas if you've got large population data, the data are, may be reflective of, obviously, the, the larger you know, population. So in this study of uh, more than a million subjects, we're looking at levels of ser serum albumin on the y-axis plotted against age. And what we can see is that albumin levels peak in youth for both men and women, and then decline through aging. Now the reference range is 35 to 50 grams per liter, otherwise 3.5 to 5 uh, milligrams per deciliter, but that doesn't tell you should it be high or low. I mean clearly the aging data suggests that it's high. Now Paul's data was 4.1 grams uh, per liter and based on that data uh, through extrapolation on this aging curve he's got the albumin levels of a 75 year old which isn't good. So um, now Aging data is interesting, but what about uh, the association with uh, all-cause mortality? So that's what we're looking at here in data from 1.7 million subjects, the female mortality ratios on the y-axis on the bottom and the male mortality ratios on the y-axis on the top. And I've highlighted in red that lo uh, um, lowest risk for all-cause mortality in men and women is 4.5 and 4.4 respectively. So you want your albumin levels to be at least those levels if you're a man or a woman to have the lowest risk of all-cause mortality. Now note this data also uh, is independent of age. So regardless if you were uh, younger than 50, 50 to 69, or older than 70 years, uh, all-cause mortality risk increased in both genders with lower levels of albumin. So uh, albumin, higher levels are better. Uh, I'd argue as close to five, uh, which is found in youth, uh, uh, would be ideal. So creatinine, not too low, but not too high. So um, first, so, so uh, let's take a look and see if, if uh, Paul 0.98 milligrams per deciliter is optimal or not. So uh, there weren't any pretty pictures, but creatinine has been shown to increase 
uh, from 1.05 milligrams per deciliter in 39, uh, 30 to 59 year olds to 1.14 uh, in 60 to 75 year olds. Um, and then what about all cause mortality risk? I should say too that creatinine is well known to increase during aging because uh, the EGFR, the estimated uh, glomerular filtration rate, which is a measure of kidney function, uses creatinine uh, uh, to derive the EGFR formula. And EGFR is well known to decline with age. So for it to decline with age, uh, creatinine has to go up. Uh, so, all right, all cause mortality risk. So that's what we're looking at here uh, with the mortality odds ratio on the Y axis and creatinine in milligrams per deciliter on the X axis. So the reference range is 0 0.76 to 1.27 milligrams per deciliter, but that doesn't suggest what's optimal. So in this study of more than 30,000 sub subjects, we can see that the lowest risk for all-cause mortality was around 0 0.8 milligrams per deciliter, with risk significantly increasing at levels below that, and risk sig significantly increasing for uh, creatinine levels that are higher than that. So uh, creatinine levels can also, besides being a marker of kidney function, creatinine levels can also be an indicator of muscle mass because it's one of the storage locations for creatinine in the body. So generally, if someone has more muscle mass, they'll also have higher levels of creatinine. So even though uh, you know, 0 0.8 has been shown to be lowest risk for all-cause mortality, I'd argue that uh, Paul's 0 0.98 isn't too far from optimal because he uh, carries more muscle mass than the average person. All right, glucose. And this is an easy one, and probably everybody knows this data already. So uh, 80 to 94 milligrams per, decimeter, per deciliter is optimal, and Paul's right in that range, uh, 87. So where am I getting those numbers from? So first, this is data in more than 12 million subjects, looking at glucose levels on the uh, fasting, glucose levels on the y-axis plotted against uh, age. And what we can see is for both men and women, glucose levels are in the mid 80s in the youth, around 20 years old, and then they both increase uh, during aging to levels of 100 or greater uh, for both uh, genders. What about all-cause mortality risk? So here we can see that 80 to 94 is associated with the lowest point of this J-curve, with uh, values lower than 80 being uh, associated with a higher all-cause mortality risk, and values uh, greater than 95 also associated with uh, uh, an increased uh, all-cause mortality risk. So again, Paul's 87, his glucose levels, glucose levels are looking good as of now. All right, C-reactive protein. So uh, first, uh, Paul's data was 1.7 milligrams per liter. Uh, which, based on the reference range, which can go as high as 3 milligrams per liter, would be considered fine. Um, and I know Paul posted on his uh, webpage for the, for the Rogan show notes uh, another blood test measurement of 0 0.8, showing that his CRP was elevated because he did a hard workout the day before, and he posted a, a lower CRP. But I, when I looked at the test date, his test date for the day that I'm showing you was in uh, July, and then his, pre, uh, his subsequent test date for his lower CRP was in September. So, and he didn't post corresponding, uh, you know, all these other corresponding biomarker data with CRP. So I can't just plug in 0 0.8 into this data because all of these data occurred on the same day. It, it, you know, it's impossible to speculate what his other data would have been on the 0 0.8 CRP. So hopefully Paul will post all of his data uh, and more of it so we can get a better picture of what his biological age uh, data is. Is it 39 or is it something else? All right, so in looking at that 1.7 milligrams per liter CRP, uh, does it, you know, is that, is that good or bad? And le so let's have a look at the aging data and the all-cause mortality data. So first, uh, uh, we're looking at what we're looking at here in this study is that CRP levels increase during age, aging from uh, starting from the 20 to 39 year olds through 40 to 49, 50 to 64, and so on. Uh, we can see that CRP levels are lowest in the young, youngest age group. Now, uh, these data are not in absolute uh, 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 values, so not in grams per liter. These are log transform data. I don't, for whatever reason, the, the authors uh, log transform their data probably to, uh, to perform statistical analyses. So these aren't absolute numbers. Um, nonetheless, what we can see is that for women, um, CRP levels triple such that uh, uh, an 85 year old has threefold higher levels of CRP than a 20 to 39 year old. And similarly for men, uh, CRP levels go up by 5.4 fold for an 85 year old versus a, a young adult 20 to 39 year, years old. So for, for that, lower would suggest to be better. So what about all cause mortality risk? So uh, lower CRP has been uh, associated with a uh, reduced all cause mortality risk in many studies. So let's have a look. So first, less than three milligrams per liter, that's one study. So based on that, if that's the only study that I showed you, you would say Paul's data is great. All right, but then we've got three studies showing less than one milligram per liter is uh, optimal. 
Man, so now we're in a limbo game. How low can you go? Uh, so two studies showed less than 0.86 and 0.83 were associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. Uh, but then two, two additional studies showed 0.5 to 0.8 for CRP. And then lastly, uh, four studies have shown that having CRP levels less than 0.33 milligrams per liter uh, was associated with a maximally reduced all-cause mortality risk. So based on this data, I'd argue that the 1.7 is far from optimal and getting as close to zero uh, may be optimal. All right, so lymphocyte percentage. Uh, and there isn't any data. I, I couldn't find any published data for lymphocyte percentage uh, with all-cause mortality risk, but there is data for how it changes during aging. Um, all right, so let's have a look at that. So first, Paul's data was 26.8%. Uh, so uh, of the total white blood cell uh, count, Lymphocytes are 26.8% 20, of that. So in the, in, the, in the data, we're looking at the percentage of lymphos, lymphocytes plotted against chronological age, and the sample size in this, sub, in this study was about 378,000 subjects. Notice that the reference range for the percentage of lymphocytes has not been established yet, but usually on a blood test, the absolute numbers uh, of lymphocytes are, are reported in addition to the... Um, percentage, but it's just that the reference range for the percentage hasn't been, isn't like an official thing. All right, so what we can see in youth is that for both men and women, so women in the blue and men uh, in the green, uh, they start off in youth with values between 27 to around 28, 29% of, the, uh, of their total white blood cell count. So uh, based on that data, we could argue that uh, Paul's level of 26.8 is pretty close to optimal. I mean, it's not too far from the 28 or so. Uh, so, you know, it, that, that's pretty close. However, note that uh, for men, uh, lymphocytes consistently decline during, decline during aging, such that someone in, the, uh, you know, in their 20s with a 28% lymphocyte percentage uh, compared with someone in their 90s having a lymphocyte, lymphocyte percentage of 18%. Uh, and then a weird curve for women. So lymphocyte percentage declines till about 35, increases uh, until 55, 60, and then declines again. Uh, nonetheless, if you compared a young uh, woman's data with uh, an 80 to 90 year old, the 80 to 90 year old based on this uh, uh, data uh, would have less, uh, a lower lymphocyte per percentage compared with the uh, younger woman. All right, MCV, so the mean corpuscular volume, and this is essentially a measure of uh, what's the fluid, how big uh, is uh, the red blood cell? Are they big and have a high volume or are they small and have a, a, a smaller volume? So uh, uh, there aren't many studies that have looked at uh, MCV in terms of how it changes during aging. But nonetheless, this data is representative. So um, I'm going to show you here uh, data for um, this data. This, this um, study included both longitudinal and cross-sectional data. So a smaller number, and that's in the you know, top here. So for example, looking at young, sample number 25, uh, the data for MCV under mean, that's the longitudinal data for those subjects. And then the data in parentheses is the cross-sectional data. So you've got three different groups, and then one group that was sampled over many years. So what we can see that for both, uh, so first I should say that Paul's data was 83.7. So let's see how it fits into the aging data and all-cause mortality. So, uh, uh, so I've boxed both the cross-sectional and the longitudinal data together. Longitudinal data on top, cross-sectional data on the bottom. And what we can see is that um, there's a significant increase in MCV levels from young middle to middle-aged and old, going from about 89% to 91% to 92-93%. So um, having lower MCV would be uh, what you would uh, be expected to find in young adults. So uh, how does, how does that uh, all-cause mortality risk look in terms of M MCV? And that's what we're, we see here in the study of 36,000 subjects. Um, so what we can see is that compared to the reference, so uh, having lower levels of MCV, in this case 90.5 to 93%, uh, having higher MCV lo levels uh, greater than 95.8, uh, at least in men, or actually both in men and women, is associated with a higher uh, all-cause mortality risk related to uh, MC, having a higher MCV. Uh, similar data is found in women, um, albeit with uh, somewhat different numbers. So 89.2 to 91.6 as the reference for lowest risk, and then greater than 94 uh, for MCV would be associated with a higher all-cause mortality risk. So Paul's data would fall into the first quartile which is not significantly different from the second quartile looking at this data. So uh, one could argue that his MCV data is, uh, is optimal. All right, red blood cell distribution width. So uh, most aren't familiar with this uh, biomarker, so I'm just going to introduce it a, a little bit. 
All right, so his value of 13.4, let's see how uh, that fits into the aging and all-cause mortality story. So first, what is the RDW? So basically, it's a measure of the variability in size of your red blood cells. So if you have red blood cells that are all approximately the same size, your RDW, the, the, you know, the variability in size will be relatively small, so you'll have a relatively smaller RDW. In contrast, when you have uh, 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 some variability in the distribution in size, so you have some large red blood cells and some uh, intermediate and, and small uh, red blood cells, there's more variability in size there, so your RDW will be higher. So RDW increases during aging, and that's what we can see here with the uh, RDW uh, percent on the y-axis plotted against age. And we can see the trend line clearly going up from values somewhere around 12 and a half to uh, 14 or greater uh, in older adults. What about all-cause mortality risk? Let's see how that 13.4 fits in. So first, I'm looking at a study of about 30,000 subjects, uh, and we're looking at the survival plotted on the y-axis. So lowest um, all-cause mortality risk was found for uh, RDWs of 9.7 to 12. That's the black line. And then Paul's data would fall into uh, the orange line right here. And those data are significantly different. So people who had a lower uh, RDW, 9.7 to 12, had an improved survival compared with where Paul's data is. So let's look at a bigger study. So in this case, 240,000 plus subjects. And what we can see here is that having an RDW less than 12.5 uh, was with uh, was considered well was found to be the lowest risk, and then values that Paul had 13.4 had a 19 per, would uh, have uh, in this study at least have a 19 percent higher risk of all cause mortality. So can we go higher than 240,000 subjects in the study? So in this study, in this study, 3.2 million approximately, and um, we can see what we can see is that when uh, compared with lowest risk. Uh, for, so that would be the group that had uh, uh, RDW of 8.1 to 12.5%. Having uh, an RDW of greater than 13.1, as I've shown by the arrow, was associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So based on this data, Paul's RDW is not optimal, uh, and there needs to, you know, he needs to do some stuff to improve it. All right, alkaline phosphatase. So uh, Paul's data was uh, around 89, and I've put in the, in the title slide that values around 50 are associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. So... Uh, before we get to that, what about the aging data? So uh, it increases during aging, but there weren't any pretty pictures. Uh, so let's, let's have a look at the all-cause mortality data. So this is data in 8.9 million subjects, and we're looking at uh, relative risk for all-cause mortality on the y-axis plotted against the concentration of alkaline phosphatase on the x. So the place where um, the 95% confidence in interval, and that's shown by the dashed lines, uh, with the, the, the strong line, the, the undashed line in the middle, the place where um, all of that crosses one, uh, that's where risk signif significantly starts to increase or decrease. In this case, increases. So for values higher than uh, around 50, we can see that the 95% confidence in uh, interval completely passes one. So values higher than 50 would be associated with a higher all-cause mortality risk. Um, so what, where's Paul's data? So we can see, based on his 89, that he'd be at approximately two-fold higher all-cause mortality risk based on his alkaline phosphatase data. So there's some room for, for improvement there too. All right, white blood cells. Um, Paul's data is 5.1, otherwise known as 5,100 cells per microliter. Let's see how that fits uh, in terms of the aging and all-cause mortality data. So first, uh, I'm going to show you data from the Baltimore longitudinal, longitudinal Study on Aging. That's where the same subject, subjects gave uh, blood test data uh, repeatedly, many times, uh, in, in, uh, in most cases, up to 30 years. So they're, they're followed you know, for up to 30 years. So what we can see is that in the about 22 years uh, before their death, um, white blood cells start to increase all the way until the end of death. Uh, so what about... Um, life expectancy. So most of the subjects uh, in this study came in uh, at approximately middle age, so 40-ish to 50s. And this is life expectancy from the baseline visit, baseline uh, white blood cell count at the baseline visit. Uh, what was their life expectancy based on that? So, um, and it's important to note that the reference range for white blood cells is 3.4 to 10.8 um, thousand cells per uh, microliter. So that doesn't tell you much. It's a giant range. So first, we can see that the life expectancy for the white blood cell group uh, that had 3,500 to 6,000 had the longest life expectancy. Uh, in comparison, having 6,000 to 10,000 had a shorter life expectancy by about eight years. Uh, even worse, having higher than 10,000, so that would be you know, the high end of the white blood cell reference range, lived about 10 years shorter than the 3,500 to 6,000. And worst of all, uh, the group that had 
uh, less than 3,500 white blood cells live the shortest. So having white blood cells in the 3,500 to 6,000 cells per microliter range is, uh, looks like it would be optimal. All right, so as a summary of Paul Saladino, MD's biomarkers on the carnivore diet. So biomarkers that are within the optimal range, glucose, I put creatinine in there probably because of muscle mass, um, and it's not too far from the 0.8, MCV, percentage of lymphocytes, and white blood cells. But there are also biomarkers that can be improved, albumin, CRP, RDW, alkaline phosphatase. And by playing with his diet so that maybe it's a little bit less meat heavy and adding some other stuff, I'd, I'd argue he could uh, find the diet that's best for him, not necessarily sticking to the absolutism of it needs to be the carnivore diet. All right, that's all I've got. You can find me lots of places online. Have a great day.